start recording anytime soon yeah all right uh, hello everyone uh, welcome to another session of park office hours uh, today we have already a couple of topics to discuss uh, before we jump in just a reminder uh, parka has a has a code of conduct and it applies to this meeting as well uh, we have the doc. Let me also share that in the message. If you haven't seen, uh, you can just reach out the links and check out, check those out. Okay. Uh, we have new faces. Maybe we can do another round of intro introductions. Uh, of course, if you are willing to, and you can say hi. Uh, let me start. Uh, I am Kemal. I am a senior software engineer in polar signals i am a contributor maintainer to parka project i'm mostly focused on parka agent bits with that uh maybe i should name another one matthias do you want to go sure i'm matthias i work at polar signals on the parka storage for the most part but been touching everything here and there in terms of parka um that's it um and i know aditi if you if you want to we've talked on the thanos mentee call if you want to introduce yourself hi i'm aditi i um like matthias said i was a thanos mentees and mentee and that's where i learned about parka i um i've been following a lot of this action on twitter and i've been wanting to attend this community office hour but since it's a little late in India, I could make time for it just today. Thanks for staying up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> who, who should go next? You can you can decide that, Titi. Um, I've been waiting to hear from Sumera. I follow her on Twitter and I find her story fascinating. Um, uh, okay. I think you muted you yourself again. Let's try again later. Or maybe Frederick, I want to go in between. Oh, yeah. so Samara said she had some, okay. she has some magic. She, she can try again in a second. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can go next. Uh, so yeah, hey, I'm Frederick. I, I'm the founder of Polar Signals, and uh, yeah, I, I've been I've worked pretty much on everything up and down the stack uh, in Parka. Like I started the Parka agent. Um, I started the front end bits. I started some of the um, storage stuff. So yeah, basically worked on pretty much everything. I'm a long time Prometheus maintainer. Uh, just until recently, I was tech lead for all things um, instrumentation in Kubernetes as well. So yeah, anything in the Kubernetes monitoring observability space, um, I've, I've had my hands on over the last couple of years. Tamara, you want to give it another try? Yes. Um, am I audible now? Yeah. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sumaira. Hey, Aditi. Nice to have you here. I follow you back as well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, I, like, you know, I, I recently joined uh, Polar Signals a couple of months back as a junior engineer. I'm working on a uh, Parker agent right now. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly new to the uh, cloud native ecosystem. So uh, th there's a lot to learn for me, and uh, I'm enjoying it very much here. It's all mostly about me. Okay. Uh, Derek, do you want to say hi? Or um, So uh, my name is Derek. Um, I'm a staff software engineer at Polar Signals. And I recently joined uh, just last week, so very, very new to the company. Um, ex uh, excited to work on, like, Parker Agent and... Uh, all of the things, basically. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
then without further ado, uh, like Frederick today, he's going to tell us about the new uh, Badger based meta store. We made some improvements and Frederick will just dive into details. Yeah, so let, let me give a very quick um, background on why we went into this direction at all. So um, at the very beginning of Parka, we we didn't really completely understand the access patterns of our metadata. And just to uh, recap, the metadata that we essentially are dealing with in Parka are um, a couple of things. So, but largely we can think of them as anything that makes a profile actually human readable. You know, um, when we collect profiling data. Um, for, for the most part, we can think of it as just memory addresses uh, that um, are being executed, because that's essentially what machines do, what, what our computers do. Um, but for us humans, a memory address, um, unless for whatever reason we might have memorized them, it's basically makes no sense to us, right? So we, we want to symbolize them with um, strings so that we can recognize our functions so that we can recognize our file names, so that we can recognize um, line numbers in our files. So that's essentially the metadata that we're dealing with. And at the very beginning, what we started with was um, storing this type of data in um, an SQLite, da SQLite database. Um, so basically, for every function name that we have, um, we, we had a row in our database um, that said the, the function name, the file name and the line number that it started at. Um, we actually still have this in our documentation. So let me pull that up real quick. Um, on our storage documentation, here we go. We still have this um, here. We have this. Uh, uh, like database schema that that elaborates on this. So um, essentially, as I said, everything in a profile is essentially made up of locations. And in the case of Parker, we kind of abstract them, um, extracted them, so that we don't need to necessarily deal with raw memory addresses. But we're just saying it's it's location number three, let's say, right? Um, and then that location has functions associated to it. And not only does it have functions associated with it directly, but we actually say which line number within uh, that function is um, or that location is on. Because we can have a very long uh, function. And whether it's at the beginning of our function or at the end of our function, um, the stack trace that we've observed is actually quite interesting because it can influence what parts of our program we're going to um, look at optimizing. Um, long story short, um, whenever we do a request for profiling data, we have anywhere between, you know, I mean, it, it can it can happen that it's a single location, but most of the time that uh, we saw, it's thousands to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of locations that we're accessing. And so uh, that kind of access pattern actually becomes very cost prohibitive with SQL once we also combined it with um, with joins, just like what we're doing here. Because what, we, what we're doing is essentially we're joining our locations table with our mappings table, with our lines table, and our functions table. We're basically joining all of, our, all of the tables that we have together. And so this became incredibly slow, um, even, um, even after optimizing this quite a bit. And so we started looking into what if all of this was a key value store and all we had was um, a way to uniquely identify a function, a way to uniquely identify a mapping, and a way to uniquely identify a location. And so that's essentially what we set out to do and what we implemented. And without going into the details of how we put together those keys, um, uh, let me show you the new layout now in our key value store. Opening a different sharing for that. So I'm 
sharing my terminal now where I essentially started sketching out some documentation for uh, for this new way of storing it. Uh, can everybody see this? Like, can, is this large enough font and everything? Yeah. OK, great. So you'll get the gist of it uh, pretty quickly. But essentially, the way that our key value um, meta store works is that we, for each of our entities, we we have a path that is the that is also version uh, thanks to a very cool contribution uh, from the community. We actually didn't start with a version path, but then someone came in and contributed us. That's the awesome part of open source, I guess. Um, but we have um, essentially a key in our key value store that identifies our our entity so our mapping for for example this is you can think of it as the uh, binary for example that we're executing so that we can uniquely identify and that we get some information about this binary so like let's say we're in the cloud native ecosystem maybe prometheus or kubernetes or something like that right that's our binary um, and we have a path for finding uh, a, a single mapping and then we also have another key um, to look up from the unique mapping um, properties that we can find the ID um, of, that, of that mapping. So that way, once we've looked up the ID, we can look up the, um, the mapping directly again. And all of the objects in the key value meta store are marshaled as protobuf. And um, this essentially goes on for each individual entity that we have. So for functions, we um, have the same sch same schema. Uh, we have a key that can uh, uniquely uh, identify a, a function essentially. And if we've seen this function before, we um, create it with with a uniquely identifying ID, um, so that we can use these IDs in the other. Um, in the other objects to, um, to to reference the other types of objects, essentially. And in a way, you can think of what we've built here uh, kind of like extremely performant joins for a very specific case. Um, and doing all of this, and I won't go through all of the details of all of the things here, but basically by doing all this, we got, basically we got um, retrieving metadata to be so cheap that it's not appearing in profiling data anymore. Before it was dominating a, lar a large part of the query um, of the query latency or the query time um, in terms of CPU, and now we can't even find it anymore or barely. So yeah, it, this was this was a super successful um, um, improvement. That's it. That's all I want to share. Any any questions on any of this? All right, cool. If there are any questions um, afterwards, feel free to drop them on Discord, and I'm more than happy to um, discuss. All right, thanks, everyone. Actually, I have a question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um... So we still have the SQL light um, database in there as well. Um, and I think there was like transcribed from C. Um, do we plan on keeping that around for, for any longer or are we gonna eventually ditch this um, and just have something like the interface, let's say just the interface that like Badger implements have, like being the, the contract that some SQL, uh, some Metastore needs to fulfill? Uh, that's a great question, and I don't think I have a set answer. Uh, like, I don't think I've completely made up my mind on this. Um, we we put in so much work into uh, this SQL-based um, storage as well that I'm not quite willing to throw it away completely yet. But at the same time, the performance gains were so vast that I also don't see us ever returning to an SQL-based one. So. Maybe I just need to get over it and delete it. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was asking, because um, the improvements were so significant. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's no answer is an answer, and we can discuss in issues and stuff if maybe it's feels, feels uh, any strong about this. Maybe it's one of those things you know that you leave in your fridge and you leave it in there for long enough that uh, you then eventually just throw it away because you didn't want to deal with it. Yummy. <laughs> Okay, uh, next topic. Okay, thanks, Frederick, uh, for like giving the update. And for the next topic, I guess uh, that's me. I will talk about like stack unwinding or like state of stake stack unwinding that we had. Uh, so maybe I should uh, start with uh, the problem description, what we try to achieve uh, in Parka agent uh, as far as like, as you know, uh, we are we are tracking down the CPUs and their usages of the, the CPU, right? And how uh, how we do this is just we ask the kernel uh, uh, for the, each process and we get a stack trace back. And for each stack trace, we just like keep uh, some accounting and just keeping track of the uh, stack trace that we've been seeing, and then we then convert those data to uh, meaningful P prof profiles, right? So. With the help of the eBPF and the Linux, the getting the stack trace part is mostly easy uh, if you have uh, frame pointers in your binaries, right? Or if you have the org debug information, which is a new format in the Linux kernel. In those cases, we just like easily unwind the stack, which means we are building uh, from the point of execution of the program that we observe, we just go back and get the, all the function addresses that we have. And this is called stack trace, right? And the action is called actually backtracing or stack unwinding. Uh, the problem, as I told you, appears when we don't have the frame pointers or the necessary information in the binary. In that uh, scenarios, we need, to do, uh, we need to do something special uh, and uh, to build that stack traces. So for that, uh, there is a standard called like exception handling uh, tables, uh, which you can find in the binaries that is compiled with GCC or LLVM, uh, which uh, they are called the EH underscore frame or another one for, uh, in the dwarf description, which is debug underscore frame. So in this PR, what we attempt to do is by using those sections, uh, by the way, those sections like therefore to whenever you want to, some exception actually happens, uh, you want to just show the stack trace uh, where that exception happens, right? For the C++, pro C++ programs. And with the help of that table, you which includes some translation information from uh, instruction addresses to where you can actually find the uh, function return addresses, right? Uh, that's why they are included with the binaries to actually render a stack trace whenever some exception happens. Uh, so we wanted to make use of that same section uh, to just build up the stack traces and build up the profiles that we want to show to our uh, users. So maybe uh, to show the state of that, maybe I can just present the PR that I have and show some code uh, can you see that i hope you can see that okay yes uh, so like in this pr like there are lots of boilerplate code uh but the, i think the gist of this pr would be the ebpf program uh, that we have uh, maybe i can just like focus on that this is the simple one and yeah maybe to just to show you how it works we actually have a, a bpf get stack id function that is provided from the ebpf runtime uh, or the helpers you may say and this actually get uh, give back uh, all the stack traces we, uh, that we need from uh, the point that we are actually executing this uh, function right uh, and the, that is coming from the linux kernel itself uh, but 
we have another program that I'm working on right now to do the those like backtracing uh, manually, which is yes, to start that. It's the, more or less the same pro, uh, program. Sorry about it. it's a little bit messy. It's still work in progress. So whenever we actually receive a uh, perf event from that point, uh, we just like try to uh, backtrace manually, which is a function that. Uh, that I'm introducing in this PR, which is actually a, a kind of a simple algorithm. What it does is actually like get getting the uh, current registers uh, and get the value of those registers. And from, from those registers, we are just like uh, looking up a table that we already think uh, from the user space and check we uh, get the instructions we need and execute those instructions. The EH frame table actually includes some instructions to find the uh, basically the return addresses of the functions that we have through the uh, through the stacks, right? So for that, like uh, we have a couple of maps. We get that from the user space, and then we get the instructions, and we try to execute those instructions. I and we need uh, to uh, have access to the current uh, registers, like uh, instruction registers and stack uh, register, uh, value of those registers. And from that, we can actually calculate where to jump and find uh, what is the previous uh, frame point, uh, the frame address, right? And then we just like aggregate all of those in our uh, stack trace and manually we try to do that. So this is still kind of a prototype. I am trying to just uh, like iron out the last wrinkles, uh, but it's like a little bit, uh, how, how can I say like, uh, we are doing a lot of work in the kernel space and we actually discuss a couple of trade-offs uh, to the, whether this is a good thing or bad thing. One of the good thing, uh, uh, good sides of this thing that means like we are not actually getting any like uh, sensitive data uh, out of even the kernel space, right? Uh, and the other part is like this, this is a rather simple algorithm and we don't have that long of a stack, uh, max stack depth. So it should fairly execute fast. And this like the user shouldn't feel um, any downside of this uh, work, but still this is experimental. Uh, I guess uh, we also uh, we are also elaborating the possibility of doing this in the user space. But first, we want to actually exhaust this path. Uh, I think in a couple of weeks we will know uh, if this would work for good, or we need to just like fall back and do this in the user space. I hope this was somewhat clear. If you have any questions, go for it. And I'm hoping I didn't actually dive really deep and just bore you guys. I do have a, a, a question and maybe a, maybe a, a discussion more than, than, a, than a question. One thing uh, struck me that one of the last things that you said was that we actually have a max stack depth, right? Which means that um, at most we're doing a certain amount of um, steps during unwinding, right? Yeah, exactly. So this is actually, I find this pr super interesting because technically the there's a binary search in um, finding the correct uh table entry in the exception uh, handling frames right yeah. um so technically that's like a log n um runtime but uh, and the the evpf verifier is very strict <laughs> about not letting us do anything that's potentially um uh, unbound runtime right um but because this is the same this is limited to the number of frames that we're producing i think we can actually completely unroll this for loop 
always in line, even finding the right exception handling table row. And I, I think we should always get a constant upper time um, limit, which I think I think is is super cool. Like it's it's one of those things that um, eBPF has made me think about much more than than I used to. And I think it's I I don't know. I think it's really cool. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like to make that happen, I had to just like fight with verifier a lot for the past few weeks. Uh, but like the verifier is happy right now. And like, <laughs> uh, as you said, like it's uh, a bounded for loop and like the we know the worst case. And the, actually the binary search was a kind of premature optimization from the memory because we can we could have just used a hash map and put the table as is, which means it's a constant lookup time. Uh, but we just wanted to save uh, some memory uh, because like it's already memory intensive because the, the, we are just like uh, getting the whole, like whole EH frame, whole table to the kernel space. Maybe I just I should just like say that not the whole one. We, it's in that actual table, we have lots of instructions, but we only just like filter the ones that we actually need to do the stack unwinding. Even with that, it's a huge table. Uh, if you have a big binary, it depends on your instruction set uh, always. But like uh, the examples that we, we have seen in the out, out in the wild, it could be really, really big. So that's why this like we need to be super aware about like the memory of plus also uh, the time complexity of this thing because we don't want to just bloat the kernel space. Yes. Yeah, it's a it's a fun um, like classic engineering trade off, right? Like it's we either choose to use more memory or we choose to spend more CPU cycles. Um, I think it's always always cool to see when it got, comes down to those fundamental uh, trade offs. Uh, and one thing that I wanted to mention that I think I don't know that, I don't know if this is actually possible, but if we actually know the upper limit of um, instructions that are, are could be executed on each um, what is it each perf event, right? Um, I, I think we like if we can somehow by analyzing the eBPF program and this is pretty wild, I think. But maybe we could figure out what that upper limit is. Maybe the eBPF RFR already calculates this and actually say, right, like people always ask about what is the overhead of this, right? Um, and if we could say, at most, you're executing another 1,000 instructions or something like that, right? I think that would be kind of cool um, to be able to to tell people this is the worst case overhead that can possibly happen if you do everything the worst case that um, um, possible. Yeah. Yes, the verifier definitely uh, has that information because whenever I do something wrong, it just brings <laughs> out everything, like all the number of instructions or the jumps that I'm going to do with the program. So you're definitely right. Maybe we can just also like. Without any exception, we can maybe obtain that information and print out and like let the user know that this is the cost of this program. Actually, that's a yeah. good idea. Yeah, I think this this is really cool. Yeah. Yes, if we can make it work, that would be even cooler. But like, <laughs> stay tuned for that. Very nice. Cool. So. Does anyone have any other question? Prem, we can't understand you. It's uh, constantly cutting. Nope. Another mic issue. I'm sure he is also using Linux. What do you mean? This mic yeah. is working perfectly. <laughs> yeah, exceptions. 
Oh, it's it's going to be the year of Linux on the desktop, I'm sure. This year, definitely, 2022. Have, no, 21 are almost over. <laughs> so damn it. Should we make another Linux joke until... No, no, we can't hear you at all. Definitely, we can continue. Uh, maybe you can just maybe oh, you can just uh, you write a question yeah. or uh, in text form, and then we can answer. Okay. Oh yes. Me, I don't know. It was not mm. selecting my default mic. It is the year of Linux on the desktop. Uh, nope. Actually, I think my <laughs> like after last update, Bluetooth microphone thingy got bored with but like. Uh, and now I'm using a wide one, so it should work. Yeah, I, I was saying, uh, uh, you, uh, like you said that we are already pulling the, uh, the debug table kind of like in memory, right? Which is already huge. Uh, and like having a hash table of that would consume more memory. But I was wondering if we are like, like if we are only going to use that uh, hash map, we can just free the original DS table memory and it should almost take the same memory right like the hashes and the values so so the problem is not the having the hashes but we have multiple tables right uh, we actually for each instruction uh we have we need to, a multiple mapping right for the each key we have multiple values that's why like using a hash hash map or Hash map for each of the data is the costly operation. Rather than doing that, like it's a poor man's index, right? Having a, yeah. just a single hash map and uh, having the corresponding indices and uh, the keeping the uh, rest of the data as arrays, we just like get the index and find out the information with, that we need from the other maps. Okay, got it. That's the like the optimization so binary search. So it's more likely like using hash maps is not like just one on memory, but like we have one to many mappings, so it will be many hash maps. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, I guess one thing we could try, uh, maybe I'm, I'm, my memory is on vague on this, like uh, we could have just like a, a single hash map with a complex uh, data value, uh, but that's V, didn't use that because we don't always have the same set of values, right? For each instruction, sometimes we have one value, sometimes we have three value. That's why we wanted to use like this type of uh, implementation. Yeah. This is still experimental, by the way. Uh, maybe this is not the perfect solution. We will figure that out. Um, I'm not um, entirely sure. Um of whether this makes sense but what if um, you had uh, frequently used functions and their mappings in a hash map or a more optimized index and the lesser used ones separately it's a good idea but i guess we don't know uh, if it's frequently used or not beforehand right that's actually that's the time we actually figuring out and counting these things. But yeah, uh, if I understand you correctly, if anyone uh, well, else on the timing, go ahead. Uh, it, it sounds like, a, let's call it the least recently used cache. And if something like this exists in uh, eBPF, I think it would make 100% sense to be used here. Um, that said, I have no idea if this, something like this exists in eBPF. Um, okay. Maybe it does. There's does? a LRU thing, yeah, uh, per CPU even. Uh, Amazing. But we oh, definitely yeah. can try to use that as well. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Really, really good idea. Yeah. Very nice suggestion. Yep, like this is something very similar to group cache like where it contains something called hot cache and it promotes it like when you are when you like when a certain item crosses like some threshold like you ask for this 10 times i'll produce like i'll now every node will have a copy of this so uh yeah this, this makes sense 
Okay, that's interesting. Cool. Implementing group cache in eBPF land. That's definitely a interesting topic for Twitter. I, I think I want to say people actually implemented uh now that you said, I think I, I heard people implement a cache in memcached um, that was like before it ever reached M memcached. They had like an extra cache for lots for frequently used um, items so that it wouldn't even need to go to user space to return an item. It would just immediately return it from kernel space and therefore save, I don't know how much latency. But yeah. There's some pretty incredible stuff that can be built with this technology. Cool. I guess we are out of agenda topics, uh, but the board is open. If you want to add another topic on the fly, or like if you just want to, I don't know, chat about anything related to Parka, just go ahead. I guess we don't have anything. One thing we can discuss maybe, we can celebrate the Neve comers to the Parker community, maybe uh, the Neve contributors in these meetings. If like, uh, our, this is just a YOLO idea that came to me. Uh, but from now on, we already do that by, with the releases, uh, with the help of GitHub, uh, thanks to them. But we can also just do the shout outs in the community meetings as well. I see a lot of notes, I guess nodding. So people up with that. Okay, let's start with then uh, Derek. He just joined the Polar Signals and he already contributed a couple of PRs. So thanks, Derek, and shout out uh, from Parka community, I guess. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And Aditi, since you are there and like Prem, uh, I mean, contributions are welcome. Uh, apparently you're interested uh, to get the next shout out, uh, please send your PRs. I was literally looking at issues right now. So <laughs> <laughs> like if there are any more issues open. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, it's, it's kind I kind of relatively have less time nowadays because of uh, like work and vacations, but I'll, I'll try to, like, I'm definitely interested in Parka. So let's see how this goes. Great. That it, that actually worked. I'm happy with that. So if you, if you pick any issues, just like you can uh, come to our discord channel and we can definitely discuss about them and we can help you guys to just be the contributors. So yeah, go for them. Or if you still need help picking an issue, we're more than happy to discuss things on Discord as well. If you if you you're not sure about what to pick up, yeah, great. I'll I'll actually go through them first and see if I find something that interests me. Actually, I I can already see a couple of things that sounds nice. So yeah, I'll I'll get into some. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Cool. Uh, if we don't have any other things, I guess it's we can just like give back the 18 minutes back to everyone. So thanks a lot for joining the community office hours. Uh, and yeah, uh, if you want to discuss further, just join our Discord channel. You can find all the links uh, in our document. I guess I already shared that, but like you can always find us on Twitter. By the way, follow us on the Twitter. That's always appreciated and join our Discord channel. One thing to point out is our next meeting would be on December 28th. And we won't have a Parka meeting then. We will cancel it due to holidays and most people not working. So we see you next year again, which would be, I guess, 11th of January. Nice.
Thanks right. for the reminder, Matthias. Then, like, happy new year, everyone. And <laughs> see you next year. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thanks. It was nice meeting you. Likewise. See you next year. Bye bye. Yes, bye.